If you want to turn in your Bibles, uh, it may be helpful if, to turn to the book of Genesis and chapter 3. The book of Genesis and chapter uh, 3. <coughs> If you've ever been asked uh, to provide a reference for someone, perhaps someone who's applying for a job or trying to obtain a DBS certificate or whatever, you may very well have been asked uh, to comment on the character of that individual. Uh, what features or characteristics stand out in the person? What character, character traits do they demonstrate that may be of enormous benefit? to a prospective employer. What attributes do they have and demonstrate? And although it would be blasphemous for us to even imagine filling in a character reference for God, you may very well be asked by a neighbor or colleague or friend, what is your God like? And if you were asked that question, as you were a minute ago, how would you answer it? How would you describe your God this evening? What are some of the characteristics of your God that immediately spring to mind? It was A.W. Tozer, the American preacher of the last century, who once said, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'll repeat that. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And therefore, assuming Toza had a point, our understanding of who God is and what he is like is vitally important. And that's why Christians uh, down through the centuries have studied the attributes of of God. An attribute is an aspect of someone's character. There is a characteristic or a quality and that is true of them. And as you read through the Bible, you discover that it has a lot to say about the attributes of God, uh, ways in which his character is displayed and demonstrated. And because of the many attributes of God which are revealed in the Bible, Christian theologians have tried to make it easier for us to think about them and for us to study them by separating them into two distinct categories. Those categories being the communicable and the incommunicable attributes of God. As the term suggests, the incommunicable attributes of God are those that God does not share or communicate to others. They are attributes that belong to God and to God alone. Well, the communicable attributes of God are those attributes that God does share or communicate with us in the sense that we as creatures, and especially as redeemed creatures, are to re supposed to reflect those aspects of God's character to some extent. And to help you see which attributes fall into which category, and I'm not saying this is the final definitive list of either, but uh, to help you see what sort of attributes fall into each category, you can see on the screen, firstly, the incommunicable attributes of God. He's infinite, incomprehensible, self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal, immutable, i.e. does not change, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, the communicable attributes, holy, wise, just, good, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, loving, jealous, that's jealous for his glory, faithful, righteous, truthful. The first list of attributes, i.e. the incommunicable attributes, are those attributes that are true of God alone. The second list, i.e. the communicable attributes, are those attributes that are true of God in the fullest sense, 
but can also be true of us to some extent. And the first thing I want to say on these two categories of attributes is the importance of distinguishing between the two types of divine attributes. The importance of distinguishing between the two types of divine attributes. We live at a time when doctrine, or theology, whatever you want to call it, is not a priority, not only for an unbelieving world, but we live at a time when it's not a priority for many Christians or for many Christian churches. And that is why if you look up the website of some churches today, you may be struggling to find out what they actually believe. Isn't that interesting? Oh, there will be parts of the website that describe the activities of the church, a page that describes the leaders of the church, the safeguarding policy of the church, the social media outlets of the church, the finances of the church, and how to contribute to them. But trying to find out what the church actually believes can often be something of a challenge because doctrine, it seems, is not that important today. And what is true of churches can often be true of us as individual Christians. We prefer books and sermons and seminars that are practical, that are interesting, that are relevant, that are relational. And consequently, and the thought of reading a book on some aspect of Christian theology or the thought of listening to a series of sermons on the doctrine of God is not many people's cup of tea these days. And the blame for that disinterest in doctrine is perhaps not to be laid entirely at the door of the individual Christian. Because perhaps we as Christian leaders and teachers haven't always done a great job at teaching it in a way that makes its relevant, relevance obvious to the lives of Christian men and women. And consequently, a division of divine attributes into communicable and incommunicable may sound to you like nothing more than theological jargon, which is of no relevance whatsoever to how we live our lives during the course of the coming week. Well, I want to suggest that although the, two, the titles of the two types of attributes, although they may not be the most interesting, the most arresting, or the most appealing titles, I want to suggest tonight that the truth behind this classification of attributes is both extremely important and extremely relevant. And the reason I say that is because it was a failure to distinguish between the two it was a failure to distinguish between the two that led to the first sin in the history of the human race. And it is a failure to distinguish between the two that has led to so many of our sins since then. The opening chapter of our Bibles tells us that having created the heavens and the earth, God then continued his work of creation by filling and populating the world that he had created. For example, on the third day, he created the plants and the trees. Uh, on the fifth day, he created the fish in the sea and the birds of the air. And on the sixth day, he created the animals. And after each of those days, we read, and God saw that it was good. But then in verse 26 of that opening chapter of Genesis, we read these words. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And that is what God did. The next verse, the following verse tells us, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And with the creating of the first man and woman, God's work of creation had reached its pinnacle, its zenith, 
We know that because having read time and time again that it was good, we now read following the creation of man, verse 31, and God saw all that he was made, all that he had made, and it was now very good. Very good. And the reason why the creation of man was the pinnacle of creation was because in creating man, God had created something in his own image. God had created something in his own likeness. And so however wonderful and beautiful the birds and the fish and the animals were, they could not and they still not cannot be compared to man because man is different. Unlike everything else that has been made, men and women are made in the image and likeness of God. And what that means is that men and women were created to reflect something of the character of God. Do you remember the second list of attributes? If we can have them, yeah. Holy, wise, just, good, merciful, loving, and so on. Men and women were created for the purpose of reflecting those aspects of their creator's character. And what an enormous privilege that was. What greater privilege could a created being know than to reflect the character of its creator? <clears throat> but although Adam and Eve... Although they never had a copy of Grudem's or Berkhoff's systematic theology with the communicable and incommunicable attributes clearly defined and differentiated in that way, what Adam and Eve eventually effectively did one day was they came to the conclusion that they were not content with the attributes in the second division. And they decided they would try and reach for some of the attributes in the first division. Do you remember what we read in our first scripture reading this evening from Genesis chapter 3? God had told Adam and Eve in chapter 2 that they could eat from any tree in the garden. Apart from one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But along comes the devil in chapter 3 and he says, well, ha, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And when Eve tells the devil what God had actually said, the devil said this, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so we read that when the women saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with it and he also ate it. Prior to this act of disobedience, chapter 2 verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. But following this act of rebellion, chapter 3, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked now. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings from themselves. They did so because they now had a knowledge that they did not have before. And the acquiring of that knowledge wasn't for their good. They now have a knowledge that their creator never intended them to have. And worse still, they have acquired it independently of their creator. And so in addition to disobeying their creator, and in addition to usurping the authority of their creator, they have now assumed the role and the responsibility of their creator. They have tried to grasp some of the attributes that belong to their creator and belong to him alone. For example, in their acquiring of that knowledge, they have strived to gain a knowledge that was beyond that which they were meant to have. They have strived to be omniscient. They have tried to know everything, just like their creator. 
and taken matters into their own hands, they have strived to be self-sufficient and self-existent, just like their creator. And determining for themselves what is right and wrong, they have tried to be sovereign and omnipotent, just like their creator. And that is why we hear God saying in verse 22, did you notice it? The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Oh, don't forget, don't forget that Adam and Eve had been created to be like God in one sense. They were created in the image and likeness of God. They had been created to demonstrate and reflect a likeness to God in the sense that they were to display the communicable attributes of God. Attributes such as God's love and God's justice and God's faithfulness and so on. And the more they displayed those attributes of God, the more pleasure and the more glory they would have brought to God. But having eaten the forbidden fruit, they have now become like God in a way that they were never intended to be. They are now displaying a likeness to God, or attempting to, in a wrong and rebellious and sinful sense. And consequently, they receive the sentence of death, and they're expelled from the garden. Do you see what has happened? They have failed to distinguish between a proper likeness to God and a rebellious likeness to God. Rather than being content to be like God in the sense of division two, they've now strived to be like God in the sense of division one. In other words, they failed to distinguish between the communicable attributes of God and the incommunicable attributes of God. And in doing so, they are no longer reflecting the character of God. They are now rivaling the character of God. And as you know from reading the rest of the Bible, that change from reflecting to rivaling, that change brought with it disastrous consequences back then, and it still does today. I say that because this is still what lies at the root of many of our sins today, is it not? For example, being our creator, God has said how we should live our lives within his world. And as part of that, he has set boundaries for us, moral boundaries, boundaries that define our relationships within this world, boundaries that tell us, for example, that sexual relationships are to be enjoyed within the context of a one man, one woman, lifelong marriage relationship. And what the Bible makes clear is that God has done so, not only because he considers that to be the correct way for us to live, but also because he considers that to be the best way for us to live. It is for the good of us as individuals, and it is for the good of human society that God has established such boundaries. After all, if anyone knows how best to live in this world, surely it is the God who created both it and us, is it not? That is a knowledge that uniquely belongs to God as creator. That is a knowledge that uniquely belongs to an omniscient, all-knowing God. But rather than submit to God's omniscience on the matter, we start to question how, how does he know what is really for our good? Surely, we start to reason, surely if anyone knows what is good for me and best for me, then surely it's me, is it not? And so I'll do what I think is right. I'll do what suits me. And before we know where we are, we have not only sought to rival God in his omniscience, 
We have also sought to rival God in his self-existence, in that we decide to live as if we were the creator and rightful ruler of our own little world, completely self-existent and therefore dependent on no one to tell us how to live and answerable to no one for how we live. That is one example. Example number two. As we go through life, we are given responsibilities in life. Responsibilities that bring with them a certain amount of influence and authority and power in life. But so often we're not content with the power and the authority that our responsibilities rightfully and legitimately give us. Within most of us, if not all of us, there is a constant desire, a desire to constantly be exercising more power and ultimately complete power over those people who are under our authority. And if it were not for laws and institutions and other people putting limits on us and restraining our ambitions, we would often want to become all-powerful. We can look back over history and we can look across our world today and we can see examples of power-hungry people, people who have abused their power. But if the truth be told, we know that given half a chance, given half a chance, we could so easily be like them. If not on the world stage, then almost certainly within our own little sphere of influence. And by behaving in that way, we are demonstrating a desire and a tendency to rival God in his omnipotence. We wish to be all-powerful, something that belongs to God and to God alone. Do you see the importance of distinguishing between the two types of attributes? Yes, we are created in the image and likeness of God. And yes, we are created to reflect in many ways the character of God. That is the communicable attributes of God. But what we were never meant to do, and sadly have done, is to try and grasp those attributes that belong to God and to God alone. And in doing so, we have not, we have not been reflecting the character of God, but instead we have been rivaling the uniqueness and the glory of God. That is the importance of distinguishing between the two types of divine attributes. Secondly, and a little bit shorter, the importance of responding correctly to the two types of divine attributes. The importance of responding correctly to the two types of attributes. Now, having sought to explain how a failure to distinguish between the attributes of God can be dangerous and can lead to disastrous consequences, I want us now to consider how we should respond to such attributes. And the first thing to say is that our response to any and all of God's attributes, our rightful response, ought to be one of worship. Whatever attribute of God it is that we see displayed, whether it be on the pages of our Bible, whether it be in creation, whether it be in the history of our world, whether it be in his dealings with us as individual people, whatever attribute it is that is being displayed, it ought to help us realize two things. It ought to help us realize just how great and glorious God is, and at the same time, it ought to make us realize just how small and sinful we are by comparison. And therefore, as a consequence of those two things, our response ought to be one of humble and reverent worship. 
That is the first and foremost, and that is the correct response to all of God's attributes. But having said that, there is a difference in how we should respond to the two types of attributes. As I've said several times this evening, and I'll say it just again in case I haven't been heard the first or the third time round, the incommunicable attributes of God are those attributes that belong to God and to God alone. There is nothing, and there is no one else within our universe tonight that possesses or displays any of those attributes. And as we've seen from the experience of Adam and Eve, and as we know from our own experience, any attempt to do so is a rebellious and sinful attempt to rival God in the excellency and the uniqueness of his divine glory. There is these attributes that make God, God. And we should never desire or aspire or attempt to grasp them or to imitate them in the slightest. Our response to those attributes ought to be nothing other than humble adoration. And yes, the communicable attributes of God, the second division, the communicable attributes of God ought to produce a similar response of worship from us as well. But the difference with the communicable attributes is that our appreciation of what God is like with respect to those attributes ought not only to create within us a sincere and a humble adoration of God, it ought also to create within us a desire to demonstrate and to reflect a likeness to God with respect to those aspects of his character. I say that because that is the very purpose for which we were created by God. And if you are a Christian tonight, that is the very purpose for which you have been redeemed by God. Do you realize that? That is the very purpose for which you have been redeemed by God. Do you remember what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29? He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. With what goal in view? With what purpose in view? He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And having chosen us and predestined us for that very purpose in a past eternity, God has saved us and is sanctifying us for that very purpose in the present. Writing at the close of 2 Corinthians 3, and you may have been wondering what the 2 Corinthians 3 passage had to do with our subject for tonight. Well, it was the final verse I really wanted uh, to draw your attention to. And this is what the final verse of 2 Corinthians 3 says. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Did you hear that? If you are a Christian tonight, we are currently being transformed into his likeness, into the likeness of God, with respect to the communicable attributes of God. And that is why Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll give you a few examples. That is why Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, i.e. so that there may be the like Father, like Son resemblance between you and your Heavenly Father. Likewise, our Lord told his disciples in the upper room, John 13, verse 34, as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. 1 Peter, Peter says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, 
For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Time and time again throughout the scriptures, we are exhorted as the people of God to become increasingly like our God in his communicable attributes. And yes, it goes without saying that with respect to those attributes, there continues to be a vast chasm, a vast gulf between what we are like and what God is like. Our likeness to him, as even as redeemed people, our likeness to him is but a pale reflection at its very best. That is why on seeing such characteristics in the life of your fellow Christian, you may very well respect them for what you see, whereas your appreciation of such characteristics in your God causes you to worship him. It is in God and in God alone that such attributes are to be found in their fullness and in their perfection. But, but that shouldn't stop us from endeavouring by God's grace and through the indwelling and sanctifying work of his spirit, that shouldn't stop us from seeking to become more like our God in his communicable attributes. And just in case you're discouraged this evening at how little resemblance there seems to be between you and your Lord, let me remind you that the purpose for which God has predestined you in a past eternity, that great purpose will one day be accomplished. That is what John reassures us of in 1 John chapter 3 when he says this, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a great prospect to look forward to. In the meantime, as we await that great day, let us make sure, let us make sure that we're clear on the distinction between the communicable and the incommunicable attributes of God. And let us remember that while we must never try and rival God in his incommunicable attributes, we can and we should do all that we can to reflect the character of God in his communicable attributes. We must never rival God, the character of God, but we can reflect the character of God.